I am going to present on the uh, augmented bodies part, or that's what I call the presentation at least. Um, and um, first a little round up of um, the reading by Tom Bölstorff um, about virtual embodiment. So I recognized a lot in this text from uh, his ethnography of Second Life, especially his ideas about the gap between virtual and actual. But something that I thought was really interesting in this text was uh, that embodiment demands emplacement. Um, and um, that means that we cannot only be a body in a virtual world. The virtual world must always also be a place which is probably why all these virtual worlds have always been called something with a place, most notably there.com. Um, and um, then he, he introduces the concept of dwelling by Heidegger. And um, he says that to exist is to dwell in a place and to draw upon techne in order to participate in the building of that place. So here a third aspect comes in, which is techne. And that's what I have tried to illustrate in this little um, triangle. So the body in a place doing something becomes techne. Um, let me see if he... Um, yeah, and, and also the way that this happens is... Um, place as in Hora, not place as in Topos, because Topos is just a place, but Hora is a place that is actually created through Tekne. Um, and he also cites Marilo Ponte, um, who regarded embodiment not as a thing in objective space, but as a system of possible actions. A virtual body with its phenomenal place defined by its task and situation. And then this beautiful quote, my body is wherever there is something to be done. So that's all Marilou Ponte, 1962. Um, and um, I think that's really beautiful. I, I think it's not a coincidence that Tom Bölstorff is a linguist uh, originally, because uh, you can almost see uh, if you analyze a sentence, you analyze it in subject, predicate, attributes, and so on. And here we have the subject, the body, uh, the predicate, the action, uh, creating something with techne, and the place as a locative uh, attribute. So, um, let's see here. Um, this is the construct. Okay, so what you saw was a clip from the film The Matrix, obviously, and I think that it beautifully illustrates that uh, you can't be a body uh, without place. The place must always be there, and this is such a strange situation because there is no, there is no background sound, there is no background at all, and uh, it's, we are not used to seeing anything Things like that, so it's an anomaly. Anything we need. Right now. And uh, again, Bölstorff uh, talks about the gap between the virtual and actual, and he mentions that it is constitutive of bidirectional meaning making, value production, subjectivation, and social praxis. Um, so these things go in two directions between our actual world and the virtual world. He mentions that it is indexical, not teleological. So indexicality is, uh, it comes from linguistics uh, originally, and it's used in anthropology now. So it's about a sign pointing to some object in the context, um, instead of teleological, which is that it's based on its purpose. I'm not fully understanding these concepts yet, but I really like how he introduces it, how he introduces them. And, um, and also how he even says that the digital in itself is a gap between the one and the zero. So that demands some further reading, I think. So he also uses Avatar, the movie from 2009, as an example of embodiment in physical form. You Jake Sully? 
I'd like to talk to you about a fresh start on a new world. Where humans can remote control artificial bodies in areas where human bodies can't live. Marine in an avatar body. That's a potent mix. You get me what I need, I'll see to it you get your legs, babe. Your real legs. Hell yeah, sir. Looks like you. This is your avatar. That, that's like uh, a way to be safe, to have a safe distance to the body that you are controlling. A bit similar to drones, you know, to sit in, an, in another country and remote control a drone that can cause harm in another country. But you are perfectly safe. Uh, actually, bomb planes uh, functioned in the same way as a way to distance yourself from the ground and be more safe. But of course, bomb planes can also be uh, shot down with certain equipment. And even firearms was a way to distance yourself from your target. But of course, when the opposite side also had firearms, it was not so safe. But all these things show that distance matters and there is always a gap that is... Um, yeah, it's closing and opening the whole time. So um, now I want to give you some examples of contemporary research of, on embodiment and some inventions. So when I was at Republica in Berlin in May, I saw this talk by Eva Wolfangel. She's a German journalist and she had uh, gone to Japan to research what uh, some people are experimenting with there. And uh, the reason why I used uh, Avatar's example is that she actually saw some um, examples of how a body can be remote controlled. Um, first of all, what she's doing on the left image here is that she controls two robot arms with her feet. So she's giving herself a high five uh, by moving her, her foot. But what an exos exoskeleton can be used for is actually to, for example, well, they mentioned that doctors can remote control a person uh, who can perform things if the doctor can't uh, be at the scene. I don't know how safe this would be at the moment, but maybe in the future. You can also learn to play an instrument this way, because if you have an exo exoskeleton on your hand, uh, it actually, your body moves and your body remembers the moves uh, better than if you would have, you know, uh, just read about it. So it's, um, it's actually working. And this very short clip, uh, which I will play on the computer, shows Eva Wolfangel when she has an exoskeleton on her hand and the computer plays a um, piano thing. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> yeah, so her hand is moving. Um, and um, she met lots of Japanese researchers, so I checked out all their home pages and found a uh, lot of interesting material. Like, for example, Shunichi Kasahara has developed a jack in head. Uh, which is an immersive visual telepresence system with omnidirectional wearable camera. So you can you have one body user, uh, which has all these cameras on his head, and then you have a ghost user. Uh, connected to this is the jack-in eye, um, which is a human-to-human -human augmentation uh, with out-of-body vision. And here, so so here you can uh, follow. Um, a body somewhere and the way you direct that body is via instructions so um, it's it's a version of not having to be there yourself Jun Nishida developed childhood exo an exoskeleton and childhood VR so the exoskeleton is a hand which has a smaller hand inside which mimics how a child grips things and the childhood VR are the two cameras that you see on her belt. And you also see that she is looking up. And that is actually up toward the person who is uh, standing next to her. So, so it mimics the vision and the hand grip of a child. Jun Nishida also developed remote control via EMS, which is um, uh, electrical muscle stimulation. Actually, I think that this clip uh, from... 
Eva Wolfangel's talk is worth watching, so I will actually paste that as well here. So you know maybe this experiment with a pen? So yes, no pen, but you see it here. <laughs> so one drops a pen and the other person has to catch it, and the, you have your hands directly above each other. And this is really not possible because our reaction time is too long. Because when you see that this, the person is opening his hands, then the signal has to go from, the, from your, your eyes to the brain, and then from the brain to the hand. And when you close your hand, the pen is already dropped. But what I did, I catch this pen. So I'm really good. But no. <laughs> As you maybe know already, I was remote controlled via this electric muscle stimulation. They say EMS. And since, since she didn't show any video, uh, you can also watch here just 13 seconds to see how it works in reality. Yeah, this is all done through um, electrical muscle stimulation. Um, there is a paper by Jun Rekimoto and colleagues called Design Guideline for Developing Safe Systems that Apply Electricity to the Human Body. Uh, which sounds uh, super cool and dangerous. Uh, and here are illustrations from that paper. And I think that this um, opens up uh, various um, crazy ideas. Uh, he here we have, for example, also from Jun, Jun Rekimoto's lab, surrogate bodies in form of a chameleon mask, which is that you can put uh, someone else's face on a body. Um, and this opens up a discussion that uh, I think that we can uh, talk about. So you can basically have a remote controlled surrogate body with the face of your choice. So what will that result in? Um, we can, for example, have the face of a famous uh, person uh, on a surrogate body, or we can have the face of our loved one. Uh, will that make us think of uh, bodies in a different way, as not as um, important and connected to the person as we do now? Uh, will this create new lines of work for people who um, sell their bodies to be used in that way? Will it create a new underclass? Will it create a new jurisdiction? Because, you know, it's uh, illegal to do anything you want with your organs, for example, which could also be a way to earn money. And will it create a new warfare full of uh, armies of uh, remote controlled um, cheap labor? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you never know. In the light of that, sex robots is actually the less scary solution or the, or the less radical solution, because after all, that's just a development of the dildo or of a sex toy. There is no uh, actual human behind it. But even so, it's um, sex robots too are uh, closing and thereby reinforcing the gap, just like Tom Bolstorff says. Uh, I mean, a sex robot is closer to the actual reality than uh, another sex toy. But uh, by getting close, by by trying to close the gap, they at the same time reinforce it, according to this theory that uh, Bolstorff puts forward. And but there have been protests against sex robots too. Yeah, so I will end there. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs>